for me. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry, sorry for interrupting. Okay, so I'll share again. Uh, okay, so thank you for uh, hosting the session where we're going to discuss using African libraries for carpentry's training to expand digital frontiers. And I'll give a short uh, introduction. Um, and we have several panelists uh, who uh, all work at libraries in Africa. Uh, Lisa Ball, Victor Beto, Kemo Suigwe, uh, Tuelo Nklot Lang. I apologize for not getting the names exactly right. Um, and I myself have a background in IT and applied math, and I'll be acting as a moderator. And I also want to acknowledge contributions from Brian Camus, Daniel Oso, uh, Annie Jet Russell, Salim, Salom Tamakalo, and Adrian Terry, uh, who helped with uh, initial library carpentry workshop. So we hope to have a short introduction by me for five minutes, and then presentations by the panelists, and then some time for interactive discussion, uh, in particular how we think uh, library carpentry might work well uh, within Africa and perhaps might have adoptions as necessary. So uh, due to COVID, we got used to doing a lot of things online and uh, organized the uh, self-organized library carpentry workshop in association with the African Library and Information Associations and Institutions. And this was done in January, 2021. And I thought it worked reasonably well. Um, we needed to have a one hour planning meeting uh, with Chem. Then we set up a website. Uh, Aflia did all the advertising and recruitment of participants. Um, and then we had a workshop spread over four half day sessions spanning four weeks. Um, so the idea was that uh, people could spend part of their time and have access, easy access to a computer at work, uh, learning about uh, library carpentries and the uh, material that's available for that. There's a bit of preparation required. Um, I myself do not have any library training, um, uh, but the lessons were actually uh, similar enough to the other carpentries lessons that it was possible to uh, use the materials and uh, managed to get some volunteer specialists uh, to help uh, act as workshop helpers. So we got participation from a number of different African countries. Uh, highest number of participants uh, were from Ghana and uh, Botswana, which was quite good. Um, but we also managed to get uh, participants from other countries as well. Um, could not quite cover the whole continent, um, uh, but the numbers in the workshops were enough that we could be interactive. Um, it's quite happy that uh, it was pretty gender balanced. Um, so this we could get from the survey and uh, kind of things we used uh, GitHub pages, um, which is used for many carpentries workshops. Uh, Form Carry, which is kind of a website uh, plugin that you can use to collect survey data. Um, big blue button for video conferencing. So we set up a small server and use this. And then uh, because the workshop was spread over a fairly long time, um, we wanted to have another communication channel. And we tried Mastodon, which is um, something similar to Twitter, but self-hosted and can allow for longer posts. And known, um, which turned out to be a little bit more effective. Uh, because we can have, we could put summaries of actually the workshop content there. Um, and that also uh, allowed for discussion. And then we also had a mailing list. Um, so that allowed for some interaction outside of the meetings. Um, so kind of things we've, or brief things we learned. Um, uh, the materials were kind of nice. It's good that they're openly licensed. Um, 
but we may need to adapt them. Um, so the background of people in the audience kind of differed a little bit. And so um, uh, I guess if one was doing future workshops, one might want to change some of the things a little bit. Um, and then uh, kind of maybe bring some thoughts, at least I uh, would like to have. Um, so online workshops, as we said, are, are relatively inexpensive. Um, time of the people is, of course, important, but uh, the uh, they become actually quite accessible. Um, and libraries are kind of great as places to enable learning, uh, in particular for people outside of school um, who may need to uh, become more IT literate. Um, it would be interesting to understand how the carpentry type model might enable transformations of libraries, in particular um, uh, libraries where you have public access. And library carpentry training seemed very uh, useful in increasing the skills uh, that both librarians have and perhaps could impart to other people. And one question is how whether this carpentry's model would be sustainable in Africa. So our panelists are Kem Oswego, Liesl Ball, um, Victor Beto and Tuelo Notlan. Um, I hope they will uh, all be able to speak, um, but sometimes in Africa we have uh, technological difficulties such as power shortages. Um, so I'll, I'll ask uh, Tuelo Notlan to start first, and then uh, we'll have Liesl Ball uh, give a presentation. So thank you for attending. And um, there'll be time for questions afterwards. And I encourage you also to put questions in the etherpad or the chat. Um, so Twello, if you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you, Benson. Are you going to project my slides that side? Uh, can you project? Because uh, they may not show up correctly on my software. But if it's troublesome, I can project. OK, thank you, sir. You can see my screen? Yep, looks great. Are you able to go into presentation mode? Um, that one's fine as well, but if you can do presentation mode, that would be great. Excellent, thanks. Thank you, Vincent, once again, and organizers of this conference. My name is Duelon Tudlang, as I have been already introduced by Vincent. I am the subject librarian from Botswana International University of Science and Technology. Today, I'm going to share with you what I have learned from the carpentry instructor, then give you a brief description on how information literacy program is developed, is delivered in BUST, and concluding by providing action items that BUST can use in order to embrace carpentry workshop or to embrace um, the data literacy skills. Who is BUST? BUST is a public university established by the Act of Parliament to be a research intensive university that specializes in science, engineering and technology at both undergraduate and postgraduate level. The university was established mainly to transform Botswana from a resource-based to a knowledge-based, to a knowledge economy through a focused academic value of teaching and learning research and innovation and engagement for development. Currently, the university have two faculties, being Faculty of Science, Faculty of Engineering and Technology, and one center, Center for Business Management, Entrepreneurship, and General Education that focuses on areas of, that focuses on equipping students with both entrepreneurship and academic skills. Currently, the university has a population of 1,960 for both undergraduates and postgraduate. Buist Library as an organ within Buist. Buist Library is striving to facilitate effective teaching, learning, research, and knowledge sharing 
through the provision of information, sources, and services that are aligned to the university's strategic objectives and those that are responsive to user information needs. The directorate is made of three sections being the director's office that is responsible for managerial and administrative roles, resource management responsible for ensuring that resources are available to users, information support responsible for customer service is just basically the face of Africa, I mean the face of library. Below, these are the services that we provide. Overview of the carpentry workshop that I attended. It was organized by the Carpentry Connect South Africa 2021. It was a five day, five days online training. The reason or the purpose that I wanted um, to attend the training, I wanted to improve skills on data science and also to develop new skills with regard to open science. But little did I know that the training was not focusing on the technology or the technical aspect that I thought, but rather focused on building teaching skills, how learning works and creating a learning, a welcoming learning environment to participate. The training content focused more about philosophy and teaching practices by the carpentry, by the carpenters. That's how to teach, how to help beginners or novices, how to make the environment welcoming and supporting for all, and also how to motivate learners. Below are the teaching strategies that are applied when delivering carpentry workshops. Information literacy abuse. Let me start by defining information literacy for those who are not familiar with the term. IL is a set of skills needed to find, to retrieve, to analyze, and use information ethically. In BUS, the IL program is taught by the librarians, and it is embedded fully into technical communication and academic literacy module. The module focuses on the development of competency in the four language skills being speaking, listening, reading, writing, and also equipping students with information literacy skills to enable them to search information and to use it on the day-to-day -day student life or for academic purposes. It is a compulsory module six credit module for all first years and second year students. The module is, is delivered during semester one, semester two, and semester three, during the week three to five. And it is scheduled for one hour for each group. Our information literacy program, it is a blended learning. Face-to-face -face interaction is integrated with technology. Our information literacy program content was developed based on international, on international standards. The international standard, which is information literacy standards for science, engineering, and technology developed by um, the Association of College and Research Libraries under American Library Association. These are the teaching model, the teaching strategies that we use in order to, to deliver the module. In this slide, I have compared the teaching approach or the model that we use when we deliver our ILS at BUS and also the teaching model that is applied when delivering carpentry workshops. Um, under carpentry workshop, we have what we call collaborative learning. Learners are encouraged to work with others and assist each other during the session. But on our ILL session, interaction between students during the session is very limited. Under carpentry workshops, learners or participants are encouraged to give continuous feedback 
And this helped the instructor to pace the workshop according to the needs of the actual learners that are in the room or that are taking the course on that particular time. But for our ILS, we prepare slides and we deliver them to students during the sessions. There is not that much interaction or engagement with the student. For carpentry workshop, um, during sessions, learners are given tasks, are given challenges, are given activities to test what they have grasped. But for our ILS, we normally do assessment. We do assessment prior to the section, to the, sec to the session. We use petlets to gauge students' understanding and also to identify the gap before we can deliver the, 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 the course or before we can deliver at the class. And at the end, students are given assignments, are given tasks in order to check whether they have understood or not. Under Carpentry Workshop, participatory life coding. This is where learners code along with the instructor. But for our ILS, we just do demonstrations. They do practicals later on. Ladies and gentlemen, carpentry workshops are facilitated by peers teaching peers. And these instructors are volunteers. But for our ILS, it's lecture students teaching model, and it is facilitated by the professional. More information comes from the teaching assistant or the lecturer, even though there is limited engagement with the student. Well, carpentry workshop were established to meet the high demand of data literacy skills. That has been brought by the increase of data. Therefore, this shows that data literacy is an essential competency as information literacy. When we talk about information literacy, we are just basically talking about impacting lifelong learning skills. While when we talk about the carpentry workshops, we are talking about building computational and data competencies. So what's next? Where are we? Let's scan the environment that we are currently operating on. We are transiting from the information age into a big data era. Where more data on everything is available. Where, they, where science or research is data intensive. And this poses challenge of data explosion. And this shift is now forcing all professionals from every discipline to develop new skills, such as programming and data analytical skills in order for them to carry out just a basic research, to implement policies and to make informed decisions. Are we in board with regard to data literacy skills at Bust Labra? Well, I believe we are on the right track. Currently, we have four colleagues that have participated on the Labra Carpentry Workshop. The very first library carpentry workshop was uh, organized by Aflia, as Benson has already pointed out. We also have three colleagues that have uh, participated on the data carpentry workshop and one carpentry maintainer, and one is in progress of becoming a certified carpentry instructor. So what about the user community we are serving? Well, I believe there is a data literacy skill gap. Why? Because literature shows that massive data sets is available in the academic world. Therefore, one needs to acquire data literacy skills to handle the, the situation. How can BUSD as an institution handle the situation? 
In order to meet the needs of data literacy among abuse community, I believe I and my colleagues, we should be able to apply skills that we have learned at the carpentry workshops, adopt the carpentry workshops teaching model or practices, more especially the collaborative learning. I like that concept. Incorporate data literacy content into IL program. Even though our IL is scheduled one hour, we can make an extension in order to incorporate the data literacy content. We, I recommend that we can introduce carpentry workshop internally. This will lead to the growth of carpentry community within BUS. Employ peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. This will encourage and participate. This will encourage and increase participation of BUS community. I believe all these action items can help BUS to move with current trends in open science and big data era. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Benson. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any quick questions? Um, if not, we can uh, proceed to the next presentation and then we'll have a uh, more complete discussion at the end. So thank you very much, Twello. Um, thank you, Vincent. I'm trying to stop use... my slides. Thanks. There is no how you can assist that side. I don't know what is happening on my monitor here. Ah, uh, we'll see that it can stop participant sharing. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is uh, Liesl Ball from the University of Pretoria. Um, All right. Can you, you can you see my slides? Yep, looks and, great. And can you hear me clearly? Yep. Are you able to go into presentation mode? Uh, I mean, that's also fine. But uh... um, th as this is a PDF, it is not a presentation mode. So sorry. Okay. Um, All right, that's fine. Into, you can go into presentation mode by if you hit view. Oh, all right. Let me see view. And then full screen mode. All right, thank you. Great, great for thanks for that. All right, I just want to do um, say um, hi. I'm Diesel Bull, and thank you for this opportunity. So I am from the Department of Information Science at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Um, it is really a privilege to be part of this panel that explores the possibility of using African libraries as platforms for carpentry's training. Um, and in this part of the panel, so in my presentation, um, I would like to look at some examples of initiatives that are happening in libraries and related institutions in South Africa with regards to teaching data skills um, to support um, our argument. Um, and in this way, I would like to, uh, I think what I would like to get to is that some of this, to some extent, some of the preparation has already started and the space and opportunity uh, for data training um, in libraries um, has already happened and it is therefore to, to expand and explore further. As part of my introduction, it is perhaps necessary to emphasize just again what I think we have been saying and all know, but that the growing, uh, the, the growing importance of AI and related technologies. So specifically also the, the ability that, um, that people need to work and manage data and specifically large data sets. And data skills, 
are needed for people to thrive and flourish in the fourth industrial revolution. And this has been highlighted many times. Just as an example, a recent presentation at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research um, has highlighted that there are gaps in AI and data skills on a country level. And um, of course, then highlighting the necess necessity to build capacity um, to be competitive and be able to build a better future with these new and important technologies. Now in this panel, we are arguing that libraries can be seen as inclusive spaces to provide training and education and particularly for carpentries that teach data and coding skills. Um, so to support our argument, I would like to look at some examples of things that are already happening um, in different libraries. And we, by, in, in this way, Mana, I'm looking at different types of libraries um, and different initiatives. So the first example that I would look at, would like to look at, is um, the teaching of coding skills in a library environment, actually for different age, uh, age groups, starting at primary school level, but then also being um, available to different school levels. So UKS is a company that provides library and document management solutions, but they have seen this gap and necessity. And they offer a program to teach coding skills um, and AI fundamentals. So they have recognized this need and that this is not necessarily sufficiently addressed at school level. So their focus is more on a school level, but they've seen that there's a gap. It's not necessarily addressed um, sufficiently in a school level. And they have reached out with their program to libraries. So using libraries as a platform to reach the community. And so to uplift and upskill the community. So they offer the program, it is aligned with the school curriculum, and there are streams for different levels of expertise, so from novice to advanced. So what they also then offer is to teach the library staff um, how to run or supervise individuals and groups in this. So definitely using the library as a platform for data and coding skills to reach the community. Now to move to tertiary education inst institutions. And here there are many different uh, initiatives. I wanted to point out the um, initiatives with where academic libraries support research data management. Um, sorry. Uh, so, so in support for um, researchers and you can look at various um, universities that are already offering these services. Um, just mentioned University of Pittsburgh, University of Pretoria, where I'm based at, and University of Cape Town all have examples and others have too. And what they would often have is um, information resources. Um, so let's say a lip guide or a website where there's information. So where someone can go and read but also often they have um, services, so uh, maybe training or consultation services. My example here was from um, a library, uh, this is Witwatersrand, where they have a person can contact their data services librarian for assistance in certain data analysis tools um, to help with the um, analysis of their data. Um, so this is then, um, uh, so, uh, Already there is, in a sense, this idea of infrastructure and, uh, and so resources being created from the library side to offer support, information, training, support for data um, service um, with um, aspects regarding to data and coding. Um, another example or interesting initiative is the data schools. Now, data schools um, are, are also a similar uh, like initiative where um, people are taught um, data skills. Um, and, uh, the data focus schools focus specifically on uh, data skills for postgraduate uh, researchers and uh, students on postgraduate level and um, include various topics like um, open science, research data management, GitHub visualization, machine learning. 
Now, some of the data schools, uh, one such an example is a data school organized by CoData RDA. Um, and it is also in a type of a form, um, um, a short course. Um, a recent one that was developed, uh, that was co-organized by our department was also um, um, had to change because of COVID and it was also online. Um, so there was some meetings at an online space and, and then resources made available for um, self um, uh, self learning and then opportunity to get support all right but what i also want to highlight here is um the 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 collaboration between the library um uh, the the so the lab uh, could could work is the collaboration between a library and the academic department who um teaches in this field I also wanted to point out that it seems that recent conferences are also focusing on this theme. Um, conferences in the field of information and library science um, are recognizing the importance of data and AI. Um, a, recent the, a recent conference from the South African online user group um, focused on the importance of data and co uh, coding and how the library and information science community can respond. And just some of the examples of uh, presentations were practical use of AI systems in the library, skills needed to leverage fourth industrial revolution technology to remain relevant, and the use of chatbots in the library. So here is a conference in the um, space of library and information science, where the focus is on data and skill, data skills and the use of data and technologies. So recognizing that and also seeing that uh, there's a platform to maybe promote different ideas as well. So what this is to me is it is clear that there are certain developments and programs and initiatives that are taking place and these initiatives and programs aim to develop coding and, da and data skills. Um, they are from a library environment. They aimed at different educational levels, ages, demographics, um, different topics um, are applicable and being um, used. Um, so libraries are indeed inclusive spaces and can reach a wide community. So it seems to me as if a platform is being created, so a space is being created in libraries where data literacy training can take place. There's a fit and recognition that libraries and related departments can contribute to the training of data and coding related skills. So, um, so that there's this link made between maybe between scholars and you know where to go. And the question to consider is how the good work that has already been done can be harnessed, linked to, and expanded. And of course, then the possible collaboration between different partners, I think should be considered. And I thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any quick questions? Okay. Um, if no quick questions, I can maybe move on and I'll uh, briefly go over Victor's slides and then uh, so I'll share my screen. Um, Okay, I guess I'll need to share uh, full desktop and view. Let's 
which will, um, so I guess Victor had difficulties joining. Um, so I'll briefly summarize uh, his slides and then, uh, so Victor is based at the Seshi University in Ghana, and he's also participated in library carpentry training. He's a library coordinator there. Um, so just to summarize, give an introduction, uh, his university, and then uh, outlooks for carpentries and librarians in Ghana and Africa. Uh, so uh, we found the workshop useful and uh, has been, uh, says it can empower people uh, to both use software better within the library and train others. Uh, his university is an independent public benefit education. Um, so has a unique model in Africa. Um, also not very large, uh, 1,300 students approximately and small number of postgraduate students, uh, somewhat smaller than Boost. Um, and for his library, they provide academic, academic research in assistance. Uh, they also teach people, um, but they also uh, need technology and uh, to be able to provide relevant and relevant resources. Um, so in terms of benefits of the course, uh, librarians learn how to manipulate data, how to compress files, uh, how to increase their uh, efficiency at work and how to get information, extract information uh, from data resources. Um, things that they would like more, uh, broader integration with uh, university courses so uh, they could point people to relevant resources, uh, understanding the other uh, carpentries courses that are available and perhaps uh, more assistance for librarians on how they can use carpentries materials um, uh, and how we can perhaps expand uh, use of these at other universities in Ghana. So that's kind of a brief summary. Um, sorry, had trouble attending today. Um, I'll also briefly share, I don't know if Kem is on mine. No, so I'll briefly also go over Kem's uh, presentation and then um, Uh, we can have a short discussion. Okay, so I hope this slide is also visible. Uh, Ken Musugwe is uh, based at AFLIA and is the director of training. And um, I guess their view is that libraries uh, aim to help people access information. Uh, in particular in Africa, we typically have uh, a fairly wide income distribution and libraries can help bridge the gaps between the haves and have nots and contribute to the well-being of societies. Um, there are places where sharing and free uh, are possible. Um, libraries can also build connections between people. Um, so people who come in and use it can share ideas, knowledge, stories, uh, teach each other. And they also help people evaluate the knowledge that they have and uh, learn new things. So AFLIO has been in operation since 2013. It has members in 37 countries, uh, but the headquarters is based in Ghana. And they aim to train people uh, 
uh, to offer better library services, uh, in particular help information society, science professionals uh, network and improve their skills. Um, they have had physical trainings through workshops and biannual conferences. They also have online webinars, um, in particular for media literacy, and they've had uh, trainings in collaboration with uh, Wikidata. Uh, they've also set up a network of uh, emerging library innovators and a leadership academy. Um, so they have a fairly broad base of people uh, who they have connected together. Um, they want to change the mindset of what can be done. Um, so do more than just give books, um, improve people's digital skills, improve their knowledge, and also enable communities to uh, tell stories. Um, so a lot of electronic content, for example, is not generated in Africa, and it would be great to do that. And uh, use them as classrooms for different sections of their communities. Um, there are many people who, for example, have left school that may benefit from this. Um, and as was indicated earlier, there are also people who are still in school, uh, but might still benefit from external uh, trainings. Um, so one example she gives is the city of Johannesburg's library that has e-learning activities for the city, uh, Kenya National Library Service, uh, the National Library of Nigeria and the National Library of Uganda also uh, do outreach activities. Um, so AFLIA seeks to enable, uh, or seeks to answer how opportunities provided by information and communication technologies, interconnectivity, and the global digital network can be applied to equitable knowledge practices. So the equitable here is uh, quite important for Africa. So, with that, thanks for your attention on the presentations. Um, I don't know if there are any direct questions first. Uh... Hello, Benson, check the etherpad. We also have a question from Mycedia. Kind of what success metrics do you think should uh, may I come through? Um yes, I think we just lost Benson. <laughs> Okay, no, that's fine. You can go ahead with your question. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, presenters. Um, my question is directed to Liz Ball um, pertaining to data skills training. What sort of challenges um, uh, are you facing? or have been faced in trying to instill data literacy skills and how have you been trying to circumvent them? And um, also as an extension, uh, what is the extent or level of integration that is uh, or collaboration that is existing between the library and faculty with regards to data skills training? Thank you. I think you are. Um, thank you for your question. I suppose you are referring to yes, the data school that was uh, organised at our department, um, and there, uh, co co organised by our department. Um, I think so. Some of the challenges there, I suppose. Um, some of the challenges, I don't know if you should distinguish between challenges um, introduced by COVID um, and the way then we had to adapt to training, um, and if it's still um, challenges experienced by, you know, moving online um, and, and learning how to facilitate learning online, um, or specifically to do with the subject matter in terms of learning and teaching data skills. 
So I think we've all had a tremendous learning curve in trying to move um, learning online and how to support people. And I think that has gone very, fairly well um, in terms of maybe similar to what um, what happened with um, the carpentry training, spreading it over time, creating sessions where people can come together um, and ask questions. So you have certain dedicated time where maybe someone can ask a question, but otherwise throughout you have uh, like, let's say a Slack channel support or something like that or email where people can ask for help. Um, so I think there's certain challenges and also certain advantages. Like say it can be a little bit more self-paced and someone can pause a video and so on. I think in terms of challenges um, could be that if you work with an audience, which I think was also pointed out by one of the other panelists, that if you have an audience, um, you, you have people coming from different backgrounds and they had at different places and um, they have different needs, different skills and um, and it, to, to, to try and manage that as a presenter or the facilitator, I think can be challenging. Um, in terms of inter, um, collaboration between faculty and the library, I think that can um, always, um, the uh, collaboration can always be strengthened. Um, we had some examples where there was um, a, a joint effort to create um, it was uh, it, it it was a, a certain period we where, where there was um like professional development courses where people from the faculty and people from um the library department got together and and did tra training so you had some present so, so 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 it was a collaborative effort and that worked really well and i think more of that should definitely be done we're also looking at the moment at some approaches where there could be um specifically in terms of data so this was not linked to the um um at carpentries, but um, exploring workshops and things that can be created as collaboration between faculty and the department uh, to in terms of data training. I know I've spoken a lot now, but I wonder if the other question was also directed at me in terms of the success metrics for training of primary school children. Um, um, as I spoke about, you know, the initiative for, for training primary school children, I'm not sure if I'm qualified to say what success me metrics to use. I mainly wanted to point out, as I'm not in education for primary school children, but I mainly wanted to point out that people are seeing the gaps. Also, the um, it seemed that the in initiative saw that the that the schools so it was almost identifying a problem in the school level or something that the schools just don't get to because they have other challenges and and using then the library as a as a as a platform and I was just saying if a company can recognize that then surely there's um, something to notice that's all I wanted to point out I hope that answers your question thanks that that's very helpful um, I, I guess I was asking also because uh, carpentry's training typically doesn't have uh, formal assessment, um, and I assume also for the robotics thing that would be similar. Um, so I guess in Africa where resources are scarce, how do you persuade people that it's good to invest in these kinds of things? Um, I, I assume also for the research data schools they're similar. They they I mean people attend, but um, you probably only find out two or three years later when somebody's written a paper or something using some of the skills they've learned. Um, so how, how might you um, maybe assess these things uh, and still maybe keep a friendly environment? Yes, definitely assessment is difficult because you know, there's also um, no assessment uh, at the moment for the data schools, but then there's also, or at least our one didn't, but then there's also no, you can't then, uh, if there's no assessment, you can also not have a, formal certification but you can maybe say just to sort of say that there was attendance and then that the, the to, because to keep the environment friendly as you say um then maybe you don't have assessment and then it's the focus is more on the on the learning and the person taking responsibility for their own learning which is maybe also an important skill in today's world okay thanks and to hello i guess um so your information program does have kind of formal assessment. Um, is this helpful? Does this hinder the learning? Um, 
or uh, I mean, you you guess indicated that you liked some of the aspects of carpentry's training, um, but would it not having a formal assessment hinder adoption? Thank you, Vincent, for, for the question. Yes, our information literacy program has a formal assessment. Um, at the end of semester, students should sit for exam. And also during the semester, they are given assignments, they are given group work in order to check their level of understanding. Um, the impact of the sexes, um, I don't think I will be able to, 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 to measure it because as I have indicated, basically information literacy program is lifelong learning skills. So we believe that these students, they should use these skills from, the, from first year until post-grads, until other professional fields. So th th that's our expectation for them to use these skills. But um, the challenge that you are having sometimes uh, when they do third year, fourth year, fifth year, normally the lecturers, they uh, contact, they less with us to come and do the refresher courses, more especially when they start doing their research project. I don't know whether I have answered your question. I believe my colleagues here, they can also chip in on that one. Thank you. Any of your colleagues have further comments? Benson, uh, we couldn't hear yep. you for the last 20 seconds. Could you repeat what you just said? I, I guess I was asking if any of uh, Tolo's colleagues have further comments. Can you uh, just repeat what you said? I think we can hear you now better. Okay. Uh, so I was, I was encouraging any of Tolo's colleagues who have comments to uh, chip in if they would like to. Um, he was uh, encouraging not, uh, um, other comments from other colleagues on the call. If you all have other comments or want to share a perspective, perhaps from your university or your institution, whether whether you're new to the carpentries or you've been here for a while, if you have any any perspective to share. Ayanda. Thank you, thank you, greetings everybody. Uh, I'll chip in as one of Diallo's colleagues. I, I think the question was on how do we get to uh, assess? Uh, I think it's important to highlight that the course, much as the modules on information literacy skills are offered by the librarians, the entire course uh, is owned by the the, the department that she indicated that we, we are working in collaboration with. So, and also the, the, the waiting, there is less, less contribution from the information literacy skills towards the mark that they get for the entire program. So yes, uptake is not as strong as we would have loved it to be. So now if we even go to adding um, data skills, uh, as she indicated, the course is usually we are allocated an hour for that week. So it would mean uh, interest emerging from the learners also themselves. And in particular, the, the program owners, because the library only contributes a component, a module, so if, if there is buy-in from many angles, I think then uh, it would make more impact, even if assessment is not as in terms of awarding a map, but as in visible um, 
progress made in, in awareness on data issues. I, I hope I've added to what Ms. Duello was, was referring to. Thank you. And can I take advantage of being in the floor and pose a question? Please do. Yes, um, I'm interested in knowing how we can bridge the gap between the researchers that are already um, in the seasoned, uh, seasoned researchers and um, the learners, because there is more focus on imparting skills on uh, the learners uh, with little or no uptake, if I may say, or interest from the researchers. But we know how the learners always look up to their lecturers or their researchers, their research mentors. How can we bridge that gap such that uh, even seasoned professional researchers get to see the value? Thank you. Um, so I could maybe give, I mean, I have a research background as well. Um, I wish I had come across the carpentries earlier. Uh, so um, teaching workshop is actually one way that's actually very helpful um, for people to improve their pedagogical skills. And I think this is one thing that um, maybe institutions don't take advantage of so much. Um, I guess the number of postgraduate students uh, at BUST is not so high, uh, but I don't know if they get any training on teaching. And I think this is one thing that um, is really helpful. Um, as uh, Twella mentioned, a lot of the training is not on the specific skills. Uh, once you kind of learn to teach yourself, it's very easy to figure out how to teach a lesson. And so that also helps improve your skills. Um, but I don't know if there are other perspectives uh, on this. I am not sure if I would say it's all researchers who don't um, don't take this seriously or are interested in this. I think there's, I would say at least that I would that there are some researchers who would take this very seriously um, in terms of upskilling um, and learning um, how to manage data, how to analyze data, um, and to do that very effectively. I think it is increasingly important, and I think it's also increasingly recognized as being important. But I wonder maybe not everyone knows how to, or not everyone is aware of everything, of all the initiatives. So maybe part of the, the, the question is how to make people aware of the opportunities that are around. And um, that could be a, a possible factor that I could thought of. Maybe there are other perspectives as well. So I think um, that's helpful. I don't, uh, I don't know if at University of Pretoria um, graduate students also get involved in teaching, um, and also the time uh, that they might have. Um, so I, get, I guess that's the other thing. Um, if there's already an established program, then uh, it's usually much easier to schedule uh, things and get people involved. Uh, if you have to search for all the opportunities, and that's also tough. Um, uh, I don't know if there's other thoughts on this topic or um, maybe from some of the more experienced carpentries uh, people on what they've seen at different institutions that has worked well.
Um, I guess if, if there's no more thoughts, I uh, have a further um, topic. Um, so one thing that was brought up was fourth industrial revolution. And uh, at least in Africa, many people are uh, worried about employment issues. And if robots uh, start to take away uh, jobs, um, this might have kind of issues in uh, having kind of a, a peaceful society. Um, but on the other hand, if people kind of pick up these skills and they learn to be more productive, then uh, everybody's income kind of then goes up. Um, is this something that you might see uh, happening in South Africa? And might it be possible to extend this to other parts? Um, I guess South Africa also has uh, fairly diverse backgrounds in terms of uh, education levels. And this is both at University of Pretoria and uh, BUST. I guess you probably also have a number of people who teach robotics. Yes, I think, I mean, I think this is a concern also uh, for many people, you know, what will happen. And I don't know if I feel qualified to make a, um, you know, we all are wondering what will the, the impact be on jobs and, and, and so on. Um, but I think, um, I suppose, there's also, like you said, a level of excitement about possibilities and things that could be developed and created to, to improve um, our lives and um, uh, create an environment where people can flourish. And I suppose maybe I still have a hope for education that if we can, that uh, there, there is much opportunity for educating people and so maybe that's why the carpentries and expanding that some th these initiatives are so important where people can learn and develop their own skills I was very grateful for my um, carpentry session that I had that was organized by AFLIA um, and where I was uh, in invited um, and so I learned a tremendous amount through, through that carpentry's session, the, the carpentry's training. Um, and hopefully if we can, like you said, expand this, roll it out more and, and people can become more comfortable maybe and enjoy the technology more than, rather than being afraid of it then maybe we'll see more creative solutions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tuella, do you have any uh, opinions on this? I think I will um, add what Lizzie has already pointed out in terms of um, taking up initiatives that are around us, looking at the carpentry workshops. Um, I know that uh, Northwest University has been doing the, the data carpentry and the software carpentry. And also I believe um, Angela has been sending out invitation for people to participate in the activities. I believe the more we are engaged on carpentry communities, we, we, we can um, be able to, we can be able to share what we have learned with our peers. Maybe, maybe they can be interested on the subject. That, that, that's my thought on that one. Okay. But Benson, you. You, excuse me, but Benson, you, 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 can, you will find that, um, Yes, sometimes we attend trainings, but when it's come to the application of skills, um, we don't apply the skills. I, I, I find a gap on that one. I don't know how can we, 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 we make people to, to apply their skills in order to benefit or others benefit from what they have learned from these initiatives. Um. So at least one thing for me I've typically enjoyed are things like hackathons. 
Um, and this could even be some, I mean, at universities, this is usually much easier to organize. Uh, so you would take, for example, a data set or a few data sets and have people just analyze them and present what they've learned about them uh, based on skills that they have maybe picked up in a workshop. Um, but uh, the aim there is to find a data set that people find interesting and relevant. Um, and then kind of provide a space. I mean, it can even be uh, an afternoon, a full day. Um, uh, and people just kind of work through something and uh, try and give insights as to what they've learned about a particular topic. Um, I think one of the data carpentry workshops uh, looks at um, census data from several African countries. Uh, and so that's something that can be replicated with um, local census data. Uh, I think those are, oh, these provide an opportunity for going a step further and practicing where you can still get feedback. Um, the stakes are relatively low, so it's not really examined. Um, people maybe just have a presentation. Uh, um, I guess if you're doing it in person, there's usually maybe um, cost of maybe providing food. Uh, I guess if you're in a university, um, uh, it might even just be snacks or something uh, if it's a half day. Um, so that might be one way. I don't know if people have other suggestions for these kinds of things or activities like that. Um, I guess Africa, I've, I mean, for many lecturers, they're already quite overloaded. Um, uh, but maybe having one, a few of them provide some data from research that they've done might be one way to uh, uh, get a workshop without requiring a lot of extra planning. Um, yeah. Uh, does, I guess for both Liesl and Twilo, does AFLIA provide much kind of networking opportunities um, so that you can share expertise? Because uh, these are things that maybe are better collaboratively developed. Um, I haven't yet uh, worked so much with Aflia, um, but definitely the the invitation to the, uh, the Carpentries workshop that I attended came through them. So I suppose that is an option to explore. Um, and I liked your explanation and discussion of the, the hackathon, you know, maybe working in an environment and then seeing what other people got right and comparing what you could could see maybe in such an informal and friendly environment and and seeing what is possible and also sharing new ideas is actually a very a very good idea thanks uh Tuello, any comments on this Um, Benson, on that one, I don't think I have anything to say with regard to Aflia, because after the workshop that Aflia organized, we, um, then we joined the regional carpentry committees. That's where we got uh, information and updates with regard to carpentries. But I haven't heard anything from Aflia since that the last workshop on the liberal carpentry. Uh, but I mean, other other communications regarding library activities or training, or uh, I, I guess since I'm not a librarian, I don't get I don't have an idea of uh, full workings. Oh, okay, I think um, from the, the the regional carpentry committee, I think there is one that is coming on September. I, I will look and share. I will look for for the information and share the link here. It will be uh, organized by the Northwest University. Ah, no, sorry. The carpentries, I get information, but uh, Aflia, I guess I, I'm not a librarian, so I don't know if they um, if they do other things uh, that help build a uh, uh, community um, or that you have found helpful for building community. Um, 
Sorry, yes. Vanessa. Okay. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I, I, maybe I can say that, that another platform which one could consider for sharing information about this is uh, ACIST, um, the Association for Information Science and Technology. I think many librarians um, are, are familiar with that. That's a very broad based information science community and uh, organization and they've recently established an African chapter um, and, and, and through that, some initiatives and ideas are, um, and we, uh, webinars and so on, are, uh, information about that is shared through that association. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's a question, a, I guess for, also. For, excuse me. Yep. Yeah, I, I was saying for AFLIA, um, it has different activities that are targeted to librarians. I think during the month of May, they were, it was the African Library Week where they were, we were populating the Wikipedia, checking the content about our country and updating the content. So it, it normally has its events that covers a wide range of uh, activities within the profession. They are not focusing on the carpentry alone. They are trying to be brought. I believe their mandate is capacity building, looking at the current trends in the profession. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, yeah, I guess so Wikipedia would probably be another thing. Um, I believe there's a lesson being developed on Wikidata for carpentries. Um, so I guess there's also a question in the chat. Uh, are the checklists for workshops helpful? Um, so when organizing, yes, I find them uh, useful. Um, I guess sometimes I want to be able to add questions or modify questions, um, uh, depending on the audience. Uh, I, I don't know if that would make uh, things difficult to understand. Um, so in particular, for example, pre-workshop survey and the post-workshop survey. Um, but usually asking for feedback during the workshop is uh, maybe one way of, of doing that. Um, but it's not, it's not always um, as easy to capture. Um, I don't know if, I guess, uh, Tuelo and Liesl, you uh, have yet to run I guess carpenters workshops, so you have, um, I guess it also filled them out. Is there other information you think should be provided to people uh, who are attending the workshops? Uh, things you would like instructors to know that might be helpful? For my side, I haven't um, organized any workshop. And I haven't completed the checkout process, so I don't have much on that one. Okay. Uh, I guess you're planning a workshop soon, though? Yes, I'm <laughs> on the 8th of this month, but I, 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 I was targeting my colleagues here, so. And is there anything you think? First time? And it is subset of the library carpentry is just focusing on the open refine. Okay. Is there anything you think would make organizing easier for you? Uh, yeah, I, I believe I will believe I will invite you as the the, the long saving carpentry instructor just to give direction, to give guidance in order for me to fine tune my, my, my skills in terms of um, carpentry instructor. Okay. Um, so I guess apart from like community participation and support, um, anything in terms of like the formal uh, process that might be made easier or? Um, Benson, maybe um, I can say from my experience, just but that was from that one session. Um, yep. Yeah, I was so impressed with the presenters and the support from, yeah, yes, from the facilitators. Um, one of the things 
I th I thought must be so um, difficult from from a, from the presenter side is if people um, have not uh, uploaded or have not installed the software that they were required to. So I think that it, I mean there is that requirement. I think it says that you must install the software and prepare it for the session. But then if participants come in the sessions and they haven't prepared, then I think it's very challenging for all the um, to, uh, for all the participants. Um, you know, so I, you know, I don't know if there's could be that people before they join participants join that they confirm that they have installed the software. Um, and otherwise, if they do need help, then that could, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you've experienced with other workshops, if it's been a challenge for people to get the software that they need for the session, actually. Um, so there's been several thoughts on this. Uh... Occasionally, we've had like, um, at least for online workshops, we'd have a schedule with the instructors um, before the actual workshop um, that would be available for an hour, um, like a few times or a few days ahead. And if people have trouble installing software, then uh, they can try and go through it then. Um, another solution is to run things in the cloud. Um, so, uh, uh, the drawback with that is you typically require a much more stable internet connection because you're also doing uh, the video or the voice um, and you need to do screen share. Um, so it depends on, I guess, if it's an institutional workshop and they've been doing online trainings, they typically have something that Um, and the last thing would basically ask the IT department to set up the software and typically have laptops uh, or computers of their own. Uh, they may they may find it actually much more helpful to get uh, the software installed because they can read through the stuff themselves. Um, so you maybe sometimes take time away from uh, teaching the lesson material and making sure that people are set up and uh, that their motivation remains high. Um, I haven't found a single perfect answer. I don't know, maybe others in the call will have other viewpoints on this. Um, but thank you for bringing that up. I had one further question. Um, so I've also helped teach library carpentry workshops uh, in the US and some of the public libraries do that uh, whole um, training and things uh, for their patrons. So not, not just academic libraries. Um, both of you are academic libraries, but uh, do you see any possibilities for African public libraries to be able to do carpentry's training? And what challenges do you think there would be for that? Um, Vincent, yeah, I think there is uh, possibly that. That um, that's why I had that example of UKS. Um, as you know, um, you know they are a commercial organization, but already reaching out to libraries, and then obviously they're selling a product, so maybe it's a little bit different. But so seeing if they can use the public libraries ways uh, to, to offer their programs. So it seems to me that there is that um, option for the public libraries to offer a kind of training. Um, um, you know, so, so, so in, in a sense, the, the space is being utilized for that type of thing. Um, this was then for a commercial or, uh, uh, company. But then maybe if the companies want to expand and reach a community, then then yes, it seems like that isn't, to me, it seems like an option. I haven't uh, uh, been to such a event or something, but it seems to me that that's something that is happen happening in South Africa. So that's why I thought it's worth exploring. Um, yes. Okay, thank you. And would yes, this also work in both? Yes, Go I ahead. was saying, yes, it's possible for the public liberals to offer carpentry workshops, but our main challenge, it will be the infrastructure. The tool should be the tool should be available for 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 librarians to facilitate those workshops. 
Um, in Botswana, there was a project called Sisiru where the Belinda Gates Foundation um, connected internet on our public libraries, but is not all is not all of them with, uh, around the country. I believe maybe um, those who have benefited from Sisiru project can 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 take um, can take the advantage of the internet connectivity and start uh, rolling out the carpentry workshops. But my, my question to you, Benson, and other colleagues is um, organizing the workshop, the carpentry workshop. I believe you have to be a member institution in order for you to benefit from this uh, carpentry workshop. If you are not, maybe you, um, your institution is expected to pop some money to cover logistical costs. Maybe it will be the issue on that one. You can touch base on that one. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I guess with AFLIA, what we did was self-organized. Um, so for this, there's uh, not so much fees. Um, and I guess as you're in, you've gone through instructor training, you can also do self-organized workshops. Um, but the training process uh, and support for keeping the carpentry's infrastructure is maybe one of the things that's needed. Um, and my understanding is that at least for African institutions, support and in kind might be easier. Um, so if uh, some of your time is spent helping maintain carpentry's infrastructure or answering questions. Um, this would probably be easier than paying a full fee. Um, but this is maybe something that needs to be thought about. Uh, so encouraging people to become maintainers and help with carpentry things um, is one of the ways that keeps the cost relatively low. Uh, uh, but it's learning how to manage that, uh, at least within the African context, um, that, that seems maybe challenging. Um, I guess we have a minute left. I don't know if there's any burning questions. Uh, Benson, as much as we are saying library, public libraries can um, uptake the initiative, it will um, start with those who are in the public libraries. Do they have the interest or the passion to uh, to take uh, to take advantage of these initiatives? So, well, I guess I'm encouraged that there are people who, I mean, um, at least even with academic libraries who are interested in Africa. So that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess uh, both BIUSD and Aseshi are somewhat exclusive universities. Um, so even expanding to other universities, I think would be maybe a, a first step. Mm -hmm. um, for the public libraries, I think it can be done. Uh, it's maybe a challenge finding uh, interested and motivated people um, and people who get Kind of support from their institution, not just have to do it on their own time. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, if there are any in Botswana, uh, I think starting out is, is the engagement is more challenging. Um, so, it's nice to hear also that there are efforts in South Africa um, uh, on this. So, oh, thank you so much for attending um, and questions and participation. Um, I hope the session was informative and useful. Um, I guess feel free to reach out uh, to me or the other panelists. I'll check the etherpad uh, through CarpentryCon if there are any further questions. Um, and for those who find this maybe somewhat unusual time. Uh, thank you for staying up or getting up early. Um, much appreciated. Thank you. Uh,
Yeah. Have a good day. I also want to thank you for the great ex exchange and for the presenters and sharing your pers perspective and also for Benson for moderating. So the next session will also be in this room in about 30 minutes. We will have a little informal meetup where we play a little game together. So maybe we see you there. And otherwise, I also wish you a great day and much more fun at the Carpentry Con. Thank you. Thank you.